Charles Long and Jonathan Latham. Continuing last week with Louis DeSoto and Pico Iyer, and today with Andrew Weiner and Cullen Tobin. Filling the category of both artist and writer is Andrew Weiner, the author of the novels The Marriage Artist and The Colored Midnight Maid, a national bestseller. He was educated in computer science and visual art and practiced both disciplines in New York City before turning to writing. His visual explorations embrace an eclectic aesthetic incorporating David Bowie, basketball, baseball, vintage cartoons, and the American painter Martin Johnson Heed. He is chair of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside, and a recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction. He is currently completing, timely in an election year, a new novel about American religion and politics. Returning to the museum for the second time, we are delighted to welcome back acclaimed Irish author Cullum Tobin, an award-winning novelist, short story writer, essayist, playwright, journalist, critic, and poet, and recently made familiar to thousands of new fans through the film adaptation of his novel, Brooklyn. He is as eloquent as he is deep and wide in his literary engagement. As Pico Iyer put it in a message lamenting that he cannot be here with us today, he has consecrated his talents to the House of Letters just as Henry James prescribed, with more passion and intensity than any contemporary I can think of. Currently Mellon Professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where among other tasks, he seeks to convey to students reverence for great works. His nearly finished next book, is set in ancient Greece. Today, both men turn their attention to the quote you see on the screen taken from Henry James, the master. A statement both have mentioned as influential and deeply resonant in their work, and one we think well worth considering as we celebrate 75 years of art in this museum. It is art that makes life, makes interest, makes importance and I know of no substitute whatever for the force and beauty of its process. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage as they, having only met shortly before this talk, share in an informal, unstructured conversation, augmented, we hope, by your thoughtful questions. They share their affinity for Henry James and explore through his words and theirs thoughts about the creative process and the complexity of the human heart and a thousand other things I'm quite sure will open up in the process. So please join me in warmly welcoming Colin Tobin and Andrew Weiner. Please do turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. Thank you. Sweeps swiftly through the great hall and then 
goes out the other side. <laughs> and even then, in Bede's Age of Belief, uh, this was a frightening image. But by the 19th century, by James's time, uh, with urbanization and the death of God in particular, uh, the flight had gained immensely in speed and, and, and terror. Uh, and and we, we shouldn't even talk about our own time uh, now. But uh, for sensitive souls, for certain sensitive souls, uh, it became their purpose to kind of slow down the flight. And one of James's contemporaries, the great critic Walter Pater, uh, wrote, uh, reflecting on um, the kind of uh, uh, demystified, then recently demystified human span, that our only chance really was to kind of uh, uh, widen or increase and expand the interval by getting as many pulsations into it as possible. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, Colin, uh, kind of my first question for you is, does that idea of Pater's, uh, the idea of expanding the interval with pulsations, speak to you uh, in your own life and work, but also when we think about what James wrote and how he wrote? I, I suppose what comes to mind first is that moment in James's novel, The Ambassadors, um, when Strater is in the garden of the sculptor Gloriani, who's appeared earlier, he's one of the two or three, two, I think, James figures, who's appeared also in Roderick Hudson. He's now in Paris. It's, it's effectively the, the, the garden um, um, of the painter Whistler. And, and James has known that space from before. And he, and he, and he realizes that his friend, William Dean Howells, who, who has lived a life that James could easily have lived in Boston, of being a literary gent in Boston, of writing essays in Boston, writing novels about Bostonians in Boston. That William Dean Howells came to Paris and he realized that it was too late, that, that, he, that he should have come much younger, and they missed out on life. And James was fascinated by this idea of middle age, of that notion of middle age, which I think haunted him too, that there, were, that there were experiences he had not had. And so he, um, in The Ambassadors, there's, 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 there's a moment where Strader just simply says to the younger man, live all you can, it would be a mistake not to. And that notion for James of life, of what life meant, somehow or other, the, the, the taking in of sensation, that the being in the world fully was something he understood and was enriched by the books he made, which came from life. And, you know, in, in other words, that when somebody sent a novel that there was a historical novel, he saw, he wrote back, and it's a terrible thing for anyone who's ever written an historical novel, he said, there's a fatal cheapness Whoa. about the historical novel. Um, and when I wrote the novel about Henry James called The Master, my colleague, um, John McGachern, the Irish novelist, who's 20 years older than me, he's dead now, he wrote me quite a severe letter about the book. He, say, he wrote me first when he got the book, saying, thank you for sending me the book. I don't think I'm going to like it. <laughs> we were very good friends, so that was fine. And then, out of the blue, about a year later, I got a letter saying, I have now read the book. I don't like it. <laughs> And his point was an interesting one. He said that books should come out of life. They should not come out of books. And you should have found, you should have made your own person rather than using these biographies and letters and a life that was already lived. You should have imagined a life. But that the purpose of the novel is to imagine life. And I think those two, that, that, that whole idea of a novel, which, which I think comes up in, in that there's another moment where which I think every novelist has to deal with, where uh, when Fortune of the Lady was beginning to be serialized, Grace Norton, who was a great old gossip in Boston, an old friend of James's, pounced on it, wrote immediately to say, oh, it's Minnie Temple, you're using your cousin, I know who you're using. Oh, it, it happens to me a lot about my town in Ireland, people think they know everyone in the novel. Not, not that they're right, but, but not fully right. Not fully, and it's very hard to explain. And you almost need to take a Jamesian tone, which is quite hard to take in an Irish provincial town, you know, to say, he, he wrote back to her quite severely to say that, um, that she came out of life. And, and, and it's a different way of using the word. And that, and that 
art or the novel was a way of completing life, that life itself had a sort of thinness, and that the way of offering a texture was a novel. So, so, so that a novel, in, in a way, was a necessary form as a way of, of us being able to see life. And I came across the, a version of that once, and I had no idea who, I've even claimed it to be my own, but it's not. <laughs> it's someone very deep who said that, um, that if you imagine there's a movie being shown, but it's being shown in daylight, and um, the purpose of the novel, or the purpose of art, or the purpose of poetry maybe, is just to darken the room for a certain length of time, so you, so you can actually see more clearly, but it's just coming as flickering light, you can actually see the drama. Um, and that that is the nearest, one of the best ways to describe it. Yeah, and James described that experience of making kind of profound contact with reality as the palpable, present, intimate, that throbs, responsive. So did I get the <laughs> the, pal the palpable, present, intimate, intimate, that throbs, responsive. <laughs> that's wonderful. I know. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's almost a way of sexualizing. Yes. The business of writing simple sentences, or in this case, long ones. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I, but I do think that James did two things there. Which is, One is that he, he turned inward. Uh, and, and essentially launched what we now call the psychological novel. Uh, but he also, as part of that turn, he involved himself uh, intimately in the movement of the eye, okay, in, in which uh, more and more attention is paid to the kind of phenomena of life. So that in any one moment, uh, in, a, in a room in which nothing is being said, essentially, uh, uh, a, a kind of uh, a marriage can come to an end, uh, you know, an infidelity can be launched, or, or as in Washington Square, a young woman can begin to die just by turning her face to the wall. Right? Um, I wondered if, if you and I might read each read a passage uh, from, from James that kind of exemplifies, though, this idea that we're talking about of the kind of um, imbuing the interval, interval with um, pulsations and kind of slowing time down. And in and, and, and both of these cases that we're going to read, using visual art to do yeah. so. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to okay. read your um, yeah. This is a golden bowl, and um, there, 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 I'm just going to read it two small passages. One is, is from life, and the other is then, then brings art into the equation. <laughs> Maggie realizes that, I mean it's a wonderful idea, that, that her husband is having an affair, and has had an affair for many years, with her father's second wife, and her old friend Charlotte Stant. In other words, when she's going to marry the prince, Charlotte Stant appears and marries, uh, and marries her father. Neither her father nor herself know these two people have been together for a long time. They just have no money, whereas, whereas Maggie and her father are tremendously rich. There's a woman then called Fanny Assingham, who's a great gospel and finds out everything. And um, at one moment, the five of them are together. And Maggie, um, she goes outside um, and um, she starts to look at them in through a window. Um, and um, there, there's a, well, I'm not going to find this exactly, but it doesn't really matter. It's where she's watching, um, she's watching and watching and watching as the four of them do nothing. And the more she watches, the more she realizes this moves from treachery to a sort of evil. Um, and um, this, just, just, just if, if, if you just listen to this bit, I mean, it doesn't really matter what paragraph you use here. Um, 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 this is, um, yet Charlotte, who's the treacherous one, had seen, had seen, she was watching her from afar, and had stopped now to give her further attention to the test. Her face was fixed on her through the night. She was the creature who had escaped by force from her cage, yet there was in her whole motion assuredly even as so dimly discerned, a kind of portentous intelligent stillness. She'd escaped with an inattention. Sorry, she'd escaped with an intention, but with an intention the more definite. 
but it could so accord with quiet measures. The two women, at all events, only hovered there for these first minutes, face to face over their interval and exchanging no sign. The intensity of their mute. Oh yeah, this is when Charlotte has now come out onto, onto the terrace and they're facing each other in the distance. But just listen to this. The intensity of their mutual look might have pierced the night. I mean, that's sort of wonderful, isn't it? And Maggie was at last to start with a sacred sense of having thus yielded to doubt, to dread, to hesitation for a time that with no other proof needed would have completely given her away. How long has she stood staring? A single minute or five? Long enough in any case to have felt herself absolutely take from her visitor. Something that the latter threw upon her irresistibly by this effect of silence, by this effect of waiting and watching, by this effect flagrantly of timing her indecision and her fear. So in other words, that moment where one of them stands up from no speaking, nothing new is to be told, simply walking out, and they, they just watch each other. And that business of what the eye does, what the gaze does, what the glance does, actually piercing the night and would break glass. <laughs> um, but, but there's a moment, um, there, there's a, there I suppose a class issue involved where the father, Adam Berber, is a great art collector. He's going to bring his great art collection. He's going to bring it back to America. And this is his young wife, who is sort of penniless. But she's doing a tour of the paintings for a group. And Maggie is listening to her. And, and it's that idea of, um, again, watching as much as listening. And so um, she's talking about the pieces and going through um, their value and their power. And this is Jane. Um, which, and it's an interesting moment because you were talking about the death of God, but it seems to me here, that this, this is his last major novel, The Golden Bow, that, that he's moving this business of sexual treachery, adultery, which, which of course belongs to French farce, essentially. You know, the father's second wife being the mistress of the daughter's <laughs> husband, who's Italian. You know, this is, this is made for, uh, you know, many doors on the stage and all running in and out. But James is moving this into, into I think, the area of the spiritual. Yes. And, and he's using the word soul here in, in a very surprising way. So the high voice quavered. This is Charlotte giving the tour of the art. Aiming truly at effects far over the heads of gaping neighbors. So the speaker, piling it up, sticking at nothing, as less interested judges might have said, seemed to justify the faith with which she was honoured, meaning that, that the, the art collector had married her. So the gaping neighbours are being brought on this tour. Maggie, the daughter, who's been with them, meanwhile, at the window, James is very good, he's always loving, loves people at windows, um, at the window, knew the strangest thing to be happening. She turned suddenly to crying, was at least on the point of it. The lighted square before her, all blurred and dim. So again, the lighted square of the window, and of course the square on the space of the paintings are being, being watched. The high voice, this is her stepmother and the lover of her husband. The high voice went on. Its quaver was doubtless for conscious ears only. But there were barely 30 seconds during which it sounded for our young woman like the shriek of a soul in pain. Kept up a minute longer, it would break and collapse, so that Maggie felt herself the next thing turn with a start to her father. Can't she be stopped? Hasn't she done it enough? Some such question as that let herself ask him to suppose in her. Then it was that across half the gallery for he hadn't moved from where she had first seen him. He struck her, as her father, as confessing with strange tears in his own eyes the sharp identity of emotion. Poor thing, poor thing, it reached straight. Isn't she, for one's credit, on the swagger? After which, as held them together, they had still another strained minute, the shame, the pity, the better knowledge, the smothered protest, 
divine anguish even, so overcame him, that blushing to his eyes, he turned short away. The affair but of a few muffled moments, the snatched communion, let, yet lifted Maggie as on air. And so that that whole idea of merely her being there watching and listening as the other woman talks badly or in this way about art moves into the spiritual realm of the, um, um, like the shriek of a soul in pain. Yes. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to read a passage from uh, The Wings of the Dove, and it almost needs no introduction. Although it, is a, uh, it centers on Millie, who is the dove, uh, and the portrait by Rosine. It was all the while for Millie as if Lord Mark had really had something other than this spoken pretext in view, as if there were something he wanted to say to her and were only consciously yet not, not awkwardly, just delicately hanging fire. Uh, I, and I, I assume you all know that hanging fire for James means kind of hesitant. And, and caught up and, and uh, unable to, to go on for a moment. At the same time, it was as if the thing had practically been said by the moment they came in sight of the picture. And this again is this meta, almost metaphysical thing that James has going on where inanimate objects speak to, yes, to yes. people. Um, since what it appeared to amount to was, do let a fellow who isn't a fool take care of you a little. The thing somehow, with the aid of the Bronzino, was done. It hadn't seemed to matter to her before if he were a fool or no. But now, just where they were, she liked his not being. Once more, things melted together. The beauty and the history and the facility and the splendid midsummer glow. It was a sort of magnificent maximum, the pink dawn of an apotheosis coming so curiously soon. And here I have to say I'm so envious that he gets to write like that. Because we really don't. <laughs> no. No, you'd be in terrible trouble if you tried that apotheosis. <laughs> the, uh, the dawn of an apotheosis coming so curiously soon. Yeah. But for James, the very air is a viscous medium in which we all move and we all have these incredible antennae, antennae that, are, that can detect currents in the medium. And so they don't, nobody has to speak to each other. We just, it was as if Colm and I were right now completely transferring information to each other, just looking at each other. Yeah. Uh, this is the Jamesian kind of realm. It's his medium, and he uses the word medium all the time, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think the most interesting, um, or the most memorable example of that is in, in Portrait of a Lady. When Isabel comes into the room towards the end of the book and finds that her husband is standing at the mantelpiece. Yeah. Sorry, Madame Murr is standing Merle. at the mantelpiece oh. and her husband is sitting down. <coughs> and he's sitting down and she's standing up. Just, just that glimpse of both of them in that position, which strikes her as very unusual, suggests to her that they know one another in a way that she didn't think before. But it was seeing them as framed. Yes. And you find that very early. It, it, it's in an early, it, it appears first in about the third or fourth short story James wrote, where someone's coming downstairs and there's someone at the piano and there's someone singing. And in the second, as she watches both of them, she just realizes that they are in sexual cahoots. <laughs> and he does this right through them, um, the novels. It becomes this, 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 this whole, how do you know something? No one will tell you. So the only way you will know is by watching. And the only way you will watch is to find, a, or the only way you watch successfully, is to find a significant um, moment, like a tableau, at something that's almost frozen for you, where the knowledge will be clear from something someone will, will not do, not say, but something that they will appear as. And, yeah, and this seems to me to exemplify the relationship of, of art and visual art and, and James's kind of project uh, because it's this idea if, if art kind of uh, helps us to pay more attention and to be more attuned, 
uh, and, and also the, the, I mean, the fact that James actually sets up these tableaus as if they are a, a painting, right? And, and that, that, yeah. that knowledge is transferred simply by looking and observing. Yes. Uh, and I don't find uh, that to be uh, strange to my experience. I mean, I, I, I feel as if we all do this to varying degrees. Uh, special, but I, it, it can be something that you can be trained to do better, I think. Yeah, but it, it's, not in, um, it's not in James Joyce, for example. Yes. Um, and what's in, what you find going through the work of Joyce, right through, is singing. And the singing voice, or mm -hmm. people listening to each other. Mm -hmm. And Joyce himself had a singing voice. Um, and um, if, if, you, if you look, you know, how do they, people in Ulysses, actually know each other? Uh, through a small world to do with the music world of Dublin. And that happens too in some of the stories in Dubliners. And um, that, um, and we find, for example, even in, say, Daniel Deronda, that they're, they're, is, that they're, they're bringing in the whole area of classical music. James, James really knew nothing, he's marvelous, knew nothing about classical music. <laughs> uh, I mean, really nothing. It, it, I, I can find one example of him attending a string quartet, but it was in a private house. It was a sort of social affair. He, yeah. he doesn't do the he doesn't use the concert hall yeah. in the way that he uses the gallery space. He doesn't. Um, and uh, uh, um, so one of the things in Portrait of a Lady, where in the early version he did he wrote two versions of it. Um, in the early version, Madame Merle is at the piano, and she turns to Isabel and says, um, "Well, there are very few times in life." And Beethoven has nothing to say to us. <laughs> and obviously someone told him that this should be Schubert. Yes. That that, that sort of um, piano music, I mean Beethoven's piano music, I mean, especially with the with the um, with the sonatas, that you do get a lot of rattle, you know, in them. And there might be a gentle melancholy as the Schubert sonatas. And change that word to Schubert. I have to say, I had, a, I had a student at Columbia who wrote me a full essay on that word change. Yeah. And it was one of the most brilliant pieces yes. because it changed. And the change just didn't know the difference. I, 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 I should think you had bad taste in music. Um, um, yes, but you, know. you see, the other thing, which I'm going to throw at you, uh, <laughs> and to see where, where you're coming from on yeah. this, is um, didn't he also have bad taste in art? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the best spot yes. where um, James, you think, oh, right, look at his dates, look at who he knew in France, look at the fact that he was, you know, he was reading Flaubert very early, he was yes. in Balzac, and then he was paying attention to everyone who was writing in France. Yeah. And, that, and that gave him an enormous advantage in English letters. But then look at the pieces he wrote about art. Yeah. Whereas, oh, dear. He didn't think the impressionists were important. He thought it wouldn't last. <laughs> it the sweat, when he decides to dis impressionism, you go, please don't, please don't write <laughs> it. No, it's true. But in, in a way, it almost doesn't matter because it's what he did with it. Uh, let, me, let me finish this, this because this, he's doing that here. What in fact befell was that, as she afterwards made out, it was Lord Mark who said nothing in particular. It was she herself who said all. She couldn't help that. It came. And the reason it came was that she found herself, for the first moment, looking at the mysterious portrait through tears. Perhaps it was her tears that made it just then so strange and fair, as wonderful as he had said, the face of a young woman all splendidly drawn, down to the hands and splendidly dressed, a face almost livid in hue, yet handsome in sadness and crowned with a mass of hair, rolled back and high, that must, before fading with time, have had a family resemblance to her own. The lady in question at all events, with her slightly Michelangelesque squareness, her eyes of other days, her full lips, her long neck, her recorded jewels, her brocaded and wasted reds, was a very great personage, only unaccompanied by a joy. And she was dead, dead, dead. And I love that. I mean, that's, that, that's to me, if I, you could do that now. Yeah. It seems to me. And that's, I mean, it doesn't matter that the port, that, his, that the Bronzini is kitsch, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Because it's what he does 
Right. And can you remind me, and is that in London or in Venice? Where, this where? is Venice. Yes, yeah, they're actually in Venice. Yeah. 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 Millie recognized her exactly in words that had nothing to do. So she recognized the portrait exactly in words that had nothing to do with her. I shall never be better than this, she said. So she finally speaks. It's a great line. Just a fantastic line. I'm very envious of. He smiled at her. So Lord Mark is right there. He smiled at her for the portrait. Then she, he said, you'd scarce need to be better, for surely that's well enough. But you are, one feels as it happens, better. Because splendid as she is, one doubts if she was good. He hadn't understood. And I love that, too. That's <laughs> a great sentence. James, is, I mean, people accuse me of writing long, meaningless sentences. Yeah. Listen to that. <laughs> yeah, because it's still hadn't <laughs> understood. Yeah. You know, she'd been having this extraordinary, complex response to the painting. Yes. And... Then, yeah. Lord Mark, of course, <laughs> he, you know, he's got a term, and he's, he's a dull old Yeah, like, I mean, he's a feel, black I feel for him. He's yeah. a black <laughs> <old guy. laughs> He hasn't understood. But, that's, but that line, that's James with his knife, and, and his cruelty, and his, and his, I mean, it's a remarkable timing, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The rhythm of it. She was before the picture, I'm almost done. Uh, but Come she, on forever. Come on. <laughs> she was before the picture, but she had turned to him. And she didn't care for the minute he noticed her tears. It was probably as good a moment as she should ever have with him. It was perhaps as good a moment as she should ever have with anyone. Or have in any connection, whatever. I mean, she said, that everything this afternoon has been too beautiful. And that perhaps everything together will never be so right again. I'm very glad, therefore, you've been a part of it. <laughs> wow. I mean, it gives me a yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the other section that, that you mentioned, we've been, we've been having this email exchange, where um, it, it, it's in the ambassadors, and Strater goes out to the French countryside because he wants to, in a way, experience just looking at light and shade um, in, in this old country. A painting, yeah. is, is it from time? Um, it's uh, it's uh, he's in a gallery on Tremont Street in Boston. Yes, that's right, Jack. Tremont Street. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he sees a painting. And he sees a painting. And this, so he's in the French countryside. He randomly gets off the train, and he's reminded of that painting. And yeah. and and James has this way of merging his memory in, of Boston and that painting in that gallery that he almost bought but he couldn't afford. Which again is part of his middle age regret. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. yeah, if he hadn't lived, right? Yeah. Uh, but, he, but the painting becomes, at, uh, it merges and becomes one with the French countryside that he's looking at and then until around, around the corner of the river comes this boat with two, two figures in it. That, and, yeah. and one of the figures um, is visible to James. Oh, sorry, to not to James, to straighter. It's funny to think about James. And of course, it's, it's that we're back again with the idea of the painting and then framing a moment. Yeah. And he sees her turn yeah. and cover herself with an umbrella, with, with her umbrella, so that she can't be seen. Yeah. And then? And then, well, and then he sees that she has said something to her, her fellow traveler, this, this man who's there. And that they both have become stiff and they're not looking at him. Yeah. So he knows that it, it's now he is involved. Yeah. And it's suddenly they are they are he's seeing them, but they're seeing him. And it's one of those Jamesian moments where the antennae are going yeah. like this across the distance of, yeah. across the river, and much is being communicated. And it becomes the most yeah. frightening moment because clearly they are staying somewhere locally. Yeah. They can't understand together. And they cannot pretend this is the case. It would be almost as though you'd come up to Santa Barbara for the weekend with some person you should not be with. You met someone from Los Angeles on the street. And say, oh no, we're just we're just going back, and then you have to go back with them the whole way with, with, with just your clothes, having left yeah. your suitcase behind. <laughs> so it moves from the you know from the whole idea of art and the exquisite business of the French landscape into pure, <coughs> natural embarrassment that you go, oh no! <laughs> Which is a great segue because I want to talk about how art assists in our perception of complexity. Uh, and, uh, and how if, if, if art makes us become, pay more attention, become more attuned, it becomes harder for us to kind of rest on reductive uh, assumptions 
It becomes harder for us to ignore, for example, the fact that what's good in us is often accompanied by what's bad. And, and, and Colin, you know, James spoke of the confusion of life in, in this regard, and of the close connection between what help, the things that help and the things that hurt. And I guess I wanted to ask you if, if that has been any kind of operating principle in your, in your own work. Um, I, that, I, it's just, I suppose it starts, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw the question back to you in a second, because I, because I, I think this is important. It's something perhaps we all share in some way. Uh, you know, I, I was working in the Motor Taxation Office of Wexford County Council in the summer from college. It was the most terrible job. It was before computers, and each car in the county had a file. My job was to check the roll in place. And uh, they all dusty, and I had hair, and all of us. For some reason, I picked this book, and I just spent all day thinking about it. I was going to get home the evening to go back to Port of the Lady. I sort of, you know, a small Irish town, I'd met no one, no one like, you know, I, I didn't know even what Albany meant. I didn't know that too maybe was a provincial place. I was taken over by the book. And um, the other book that mattered just as much in the same sort of period of time was um, The Sun Also Rises, was the, the whole idea of, of, um, of someone, again, he's American, but I, I was almost thinking of myself going to Spain, getting, going out into the sensuous universe and living in it, and um, having a sensuous life. Um, and rather than say what we were in Ireland at the time, we were meant to be about to have a solemn life. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that sensuousness is a kind of seriousness. Yeah. And especially in Portrait of the Lady, where Isabel Archer's journey uh, to find something spiritual and sensuous and serious for herself yeah. will be dramatized in the book. Yeah. And I suppose that mattered enormously to me. And it gave me a key to how I should live. Now, I didn't know this. I mean, in other words, it affected me deeply enough um, that I didn't understand it you know, enough, but that um, nothing was ever the same again. Um, I mean, did you, when, uh, did you have, to, when did you read those books first? I actually read that. That book changed my life in my 30s. I came to it late. Uh, but completely the same experience, but I, I, I had a stunted growth, I guess. <laughs> you know but so where were you when you read I was, I had just come back from New York, from the art world, actually. Uh, and I needed that, I didn't realize it, but I needed that book. I needed that book, Portrait of a Lady. Uh, and what I needed was Isabel's refusal, because the process of finding those things was one of refusing things. She, one by one, she says no to a whole series of kind of opportunities that are thrown her way. And in fact, the book is a kind of uh, an apotheosis of negation, to <laughs> use that word, uh, that word again, because she ultimately, the only thing she doesn't say no to, finally, is this horrible marriage that she has to, the, to, to Ozma. Right? Yeah, but I think the issue in the book isn't that the, it looks as though it's going to be a novel about style. Yes. That, that it's Osmond's style that attracts her. Mm -hmm. And somehow that the style of the other two men is too brusque or too, or too rough in the American case, and in case of the Englishman, just too gentle. But it's all, it's all about a sort of um, moving, somebody seeking a style by which to live. Yes. And slowly the Puritan in James emerges. <laughs> but actually, um, two people have been behaving treacherously all along in relation to this, to this innocent striving for grace. And we watch as then the, the conflict becomes between an innocent striving for grace and a treachery that, that's really fierce and relentless and is actually greed. Yeah. It's actually about money. They want her money. And um, it becomes actually quite a moral book that, that morality takes over from style. And so you're almost, um, I suppose you're, you're distracted by, by, by the grandeur of Garden Court, by Lord Warburton's house, by just the way in which Isabella's been looking at, Flor at, at Florence when she goes there, and Rome when she goes to Rome, without realizing that slowly, actually this is a book about right and wrong. Yeah. And, that is, and that is the most extraordinary idea, that two things in James um, 
coming at each other, two forces that, that in a way were in conflict in his own particular personality, from his own background. That's right. And his, his search for a sense, he was like his father. I love when his father said that he, he brought his children to Europe quite a lot on boats, you know, but he thought they weren't getting a sensuous education in America. When I was growing up, I don't know about you, but no one ever worried about my sense. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ever give me a whole many of sensuous. Only my mother and my father said, you're not getting a sensuous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Christian brothers, you know, you're certainly not. And, uh, but the idea of a sensuous education versus a moral education. That's right. And, well, his father embodied both, because he was the Swedenborgian kind yeah. of Manichaean almost. Yeah. But yeah. he uh, had the sensual side. I, I want to read you uh, something that James said about kind of unwrapping, how he unwrapped impressions and experience. This is related to what you're, you're saying. James writes, really universally, relations stop nowhere. And the exquisite problem of the artist is eternally but to draw by a geometry of his own, the circle within which they shall happily appear to do so. The whole conduct of life consists of things done which do other things in their turn, just so our behavior and its fruits are essentially one and continuous and persistent and unquenchable, so that the act has its way of abiding and showing and testifying. And so among our innumerable acts are no arbitrary and no senseless separations. And it's this idea... What's, what's that from? Uh, this is from the preface. It's magnificent, isn't it? It's, a, it's unbelievable. You know, it's the whole, yeah, it's the whole yeah, deal. Yeah. But it's, it's, and just as a, as a kind of a picture of consciousness yeah. and of the things that we do to each other, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and the fact that no action is discreet, yeah. there really is no separation between things. There's always another side. And, and in light of what you're saying, there's always a, a kind of complicating monster out there. Uh, waiting, or if there isn't one, there's one about to be born. Uh, and it makes me think of, some, uh, of something that Borges said about James. He said, he said, to, uh, he basically said that James' work is the strangest he had ever read. Uh, and he said, you know, James has, he risks seeming like a very mundane novelist until he reveals what he really is, uh, a resigned and ironic inhabitant of hell. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know that that brings me. I am. It's a very enigmatic thing for Borges to have said, and, but it's very provocative. And I think it's right in some ways, and it makes me think of this fact that in almost every James story, there comes a, a, a moment where the protagonist says, "I'm going to take my 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 liberty," um, and and the goal is to do what one likes, to do what one likes, and. This is, in our world today, we take that for granted, that we, of course we ought to do what one likes. But James uh, in to do, saw in that phrase, to do what one likes, a, a kind of brutality and an abyss. And uh, I think he would feel the same way today, were he to be alive. For James, the, the free heart uh, was a beautiful thing, but it was also a dangerous thing. It was dangerous to itself. I don't know if, if you feel this way. Yes, I think the question here is money. <laughs> and um, that he, in his best books, he dramatizes what certain people will do for money. The hard greed. What, what hard greed looks like if you give it enough attention that it that actually will crush an innocent soul. And will not only do that, but will move back inwards to crush the self. Yeah. So that, I mean, I mean, in that section you're reading, um, from um, the wings of the dove, what they propose to do to this uh, girl who's tremendously rich when she comes to Europe, it's, it's so treacherous. Yeah. These people who are otherwise normal, yes. who are walking in a park in this, you know, Merton Denture and um, Kate Croy, who are in love with each other, who, who are young lovers, who are like Romeo and Juliet, are being prevented from marriage, and then we watch. Once the issue of greed arises, what they will do, yeah. what they're capable of. This idea of what people are capable of, I think, comes not from James's father, but from that old grandfather of his, of course, who's, who's an Irish Presbyterian. <laughs> he came to America and made a fortune. 
but, but, but he really was, the old grandfather, a serious believer in, in hell. You know, and, and that people are intrinsically evil, and the only way we can prevent that is to make many laws. Yes. You, know. <laughs> you know, and it makes me think of, uh, I think it was Penelope Fitzgerald, who, who and we haven't talked about her, but I, I love her. The late, I don't know if you know, the late great Penelope Fitzgerald, she didn't even start writing until she was 60, and then proceeded to win like three Booker Prizes or something. Uh, but she, she once told her American editor, you know, that she thinks that on the whole you, you, you should write biographies of people you admire and respect and novels about people you think are sadly mistaken. <laughs> That's great. Um, but, I, but I wonder, it makes me think, Cole, I have a question for you and I've been thinking about this for a while, is that do you, do you have this sense in your work of the, of the difficulty of what James said was his goal of kind of trying to keep the torch of virtue alive. And he said, he, he said it like this, he said, the torch of virtue alive in an air that infinitely uh, desires to smother it. And I suppose for him, virtue came in the idea of noticing and registering. So, so, so in, in the idea of how he worked himself, he saw it as a sort of virtue the symbol of giving another paragraph because if life is going to be infinitely complex, then it is our duty to notice it. The more we notice it, the more virtuous we are likely to become. The more then the novelist begins to register this set of you know, ambiguities, nuances, flickering changes in the way people behave towards each other, the actual more uh, the question of goodness, the question of virtue, will then soar, or, or, or at least rise, or, 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 or at least be given some air, um, which it won't otherwise get um, in, for example, uh, um, for example, in newspapers, or in, in any other area in which people, people use language. Yeah, I mean, and for me, I, I almost see virtue now as, as a form of rebellion. You know, against against the prevailing uh, atmosphere. And I guess James did saw it that way too. Yes, but he was. He was he, he, but he did say um, that that's very good advice. And uh, 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 using, using creative writing, the, 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 bad, the only word you need to know: dramatize, dramatize, dramatize. <laughs> so that if you have this idea of um, a prevailing virtue or a need to establish images of virtue. You need a dark thing beside it. Yeah. You need something coming towards you, sailing, sailing in, in, in a way ingeniously and and um, under the water, perhaps. That's going to torpedo you. And so that in all the books, I mean, even the figure of Lord Mark, there, the the, 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 the sheer dullness of her aunt, you know, the, the sheer dullness of arriving in Venice, that, 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 I mean, that the harm he causes. But, but that um, in the best books, there's always that idea. I mean, it's over-dramatized to some extent in the, in, or in, in um, what's it called, um, help me, um, no, the um, turn the screw, where, you know, you, like you get a sense of pure evil as personified by these ghosts who have come for the children. But that's a ghost story. But when, when he moved it back into the, to the, to the real social world, he, he, he maintained its force. It wasn't as ever absent. But I, I, I think that the best cases are when the when virtue and then the countervailing smothering error are actually to be found in the same human being. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And which which happens, um, for example, um, in the about in the Wings of the Dove, yes. where Martin Densher is actually a sweet good man, <laughs> yeah. and the only thing he doesn't have is money. <laughs> and then you watch. Yeah as he attempts to do his best while, while doing his worst. Yeah, and I, I think about this in a biographical way in some ways. When I think about Tolstoy, you know, how you know, he had this almost preternatural understanding of human behavior, and yet he didn't like his own, he, he couldn't really understand his own behavior. You know, Tol Tolstoy uh, wanted to be an ascetic, uh, you know, and yet he loved finery and carnal relations, you know. Uh, and even Henry James, I mean, ultimately, in, in, we can say that he didn't accept him, himself in, in some ways. Oh, oh yeah, he's filled with ambiguities. I mean, he loved his family, and he couldn't wait to get away from them. He looked at tender letters. 
<laughs> you know, in, 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 in relation to his own sexuality. Yeah. Um, he was guarded and, and hidden, so, so, that, so that even though he's so concerned with life, he also became desperately concerned not to have it. Yeah. And also, he really, really loved money. And, yeah. and he was always thought he was poor, and he never was. And he was always getting too much money out of publishers yeah. for books that never sold. And, uh, yeah. You know, all, all of that was going on within him. So yeah. he was working out things that, 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 that I think he, he owned. Can we, can we, so let's use that as a segue to talk about being an artist. Now. Um, and uh, you and I discovered just, just a few days ago that we both love uh, Shirley Hazard, novelist Shirley Hazard. And I want to read you a statement that she said to, to see what, you're, what you feel about it. Shirley Hazard writes, What an atrocious, sustained effort is required to learn and do anything thoroughly, especially if it's what you love. A vocation is a source of difficulty, not ease. To do is difficult enough. To be more difficult still. Both to do and be demand an effort at superhumanity. I, you know, Shirley yeah. Hazard, just in case you, if you haven't read her, there's a novel of hers I really love called The Great Fire. The best known novel is, is, is the, uh, the Transit of Venus. But, but um, she, she herself, I mean, she worked for the United Nations, and she really cared about literature. I, I, I mean, I, in the few times that, that we spoke, the few accounts, she cared about books and their importance more than I think anyone else. I mean, it was desperate for her. She, she's the woman who caused all the trouble at the National Book Award the year she won the award, but the overall lifetime was given to Stephen King. Yes. And she didn't, oh. think, she didn't think he should have got that. She didn't think he was very good. She didn't think it was art. And she wasn't afraid to say so in public. She didn't win her a great number of friends. Uh, uh, um, the problem that, that I have with that is that I'm a shambles. I mean, I wake up in the morning wishing I could just stay in bed like that. <laughs> that, you know, that, that everything is an effort and everything is badly done and that you, know, you never do anything right and that you uh, always regret everything. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you that, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and if I felt that, 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 that it was such a thing as, as an art of life, I would know that it hadn't been mine. <laughs> you know, that I had missed out on, on making that work. <laughs> you, you know, in other words, you never, I never know what to do. And then when I do something, it's always the opposite I should have done. And, and, and I mean, I do try, you know, and when, I, when I'm writing a book, to write the book properly, but when it's done, I think, oh, that book is right. And if someone says to me, you know, I don't think you're as good as you know, John Banville or, 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 you know, or some other, you know, Anne Enright, I think, oh, they're much more talented. <laughs> I, mean, I never feel good. Yeah. And I wonder, I, I, I blame Catholicism, but <laughs> 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 it's not fair. It's just not fair to blame Catholicism. I'm just to blame myself. Yeah. It's so funny. I mean, I, 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 I'm, both, I'm both comforted and you completely, I'm disillusioned. I mean, you know, all these fantasies about you. <laughs> Uh, you know, in, in, in one of his very last uh, essays that, that James wrote, uh, with the uncharacteristically unsubtle title, Is There Life After Death, uh, James kind of um, uh, came very close to, to, I'm taking us back to the spiritual now, he, he came very close to kind of addressing the spiritual in art, or if not the spiritual then this kind of um, obligation, art as an obligation that's handed down to us from the universe or from being. And I, I wanted to just read you a, a, a brief bit of what he says about that, because um, then I have a question for you. Um, he says, living or feeling one's exquisite curiosity about the universe, fed and fed, rewarded and rewarded, though I of course don't say definitely answered and answered, becomes the highest good I can conceive of a million times better than not living, however that comfort may at bad moments have solicited us. It is above all as an artist that I appreciate this beautiful and enjoyable independence of thought, and more especially this assault of my boundlessly multiplied personal relation, which carries me beyond even my profoundest observation of this world whatever, 
and any mortal adventure refers me to realizations I am condemned as yet but to dream of. For the artist, the sense of our luxurious surplus of supposition is of the strongest. Of the artist, it is superlatively true that he knows the infinite numbers of modes of being. As more or less an artist myself, and I love that line. <laughs> As more or less, more, it means basically saying what you just said. <laughs> I deal with being, I invoke and I evoke, I figure and I represent, I seize and fix, as many phases and aspects and conceptions of being as my infirm hand allows me strength for. And in so doing, I find myself, I can't express it otherwise, in communication with sources. Sources to which I owe the apprehension of far more and far other combinations than observation and experience in their ordinary sense have given me the pattern of. The truth is that to live to this tune, and in order to do beautiful things with questions of being, is to find one's view of one's share in being, and above all, of its appeal to be shared in an infinite variety, enormously enlarged. The very provocation offered to the artist by the universe, the provocation, provocation to be an artist, and therefore supremely serve the universe. What do I take that for but the intense desire of being to get itself personally shared? to show itself for personal, personally shareable, and thus foster the sublimest faith. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, but I guess I wanted to ask you, did, have you felt in your own life and vocation this sense of a, a certain kind of spiritual aspect to art, or another way to put it might be this almost communal human obligation just simply by virtue of you existing and being and having having lived? You know, it's, it's difficult to answer because if you really are trapped in the whole business of writing the next sentence. <laughs> the next sentence had better be true in relation to the last sentence. You know, if someone is up a mountain, you need to get them down from the mountain. I mean, there are technical questions. Yes. You know, and that if the door is grey, it must remain, you know. But, but I think that is a way of avoiding the question you've asked. And I think the question you've asked is a serious one. That at a certain moment, that you have um, isolated a character to such an extent, morally, physically, um, in relation to society, you, you, you have given them enough life that actually you now can let them soar for a second, just for a second, in some way they see, or notice, or feel, or even feel disappointment, or even feel sadness, you must move it up. If you don't move it up, you are merely stuck. You, 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 you are, well, let me just get this right. If you don't move your character, if you don't allow your character, or your reader, that possibility of transcendence, even by a tone, even by allowing in a sentence that will somehow or other have a mysterious shimmering quality that will take a risk of suggesting that this is who we are in the world, that we are fated to be here in time, and we live in time, but in one moment is possible that that time could relent, that the time could dissolve, that something pure and real and true could emerge in that second and get held and be and then fade again. I think you have to win that. Yes. And then you have to be careful almost that you don't announce you've done it when you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes part of the fabric or texture of the book. But without, with, without the, 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 that moment where the reader just goes, puts the book down for a second, unsure what it was that caused the, the universe to become, I, I, I hesitate to say it, like more, more glittering, more, more, more interesting, mm -hmm. and that the whole business of time, just the, the, the dull business of the day, simply dis dissolving to some other question. Yeah. I, I mean, and if someone said, well, what's the difference between that and prayer? But prayer is fully dedicated to that. 
Yes. But it's a question of bringing in that tone and allowing it to live in in in, in the pages. It's, um, but it's, it's a really really difficult one. Because yeah. I wouldn't like to try and teach it, for example, yeah. because <laughs> you know if the students started to do it, they'd stop doing it because yes. you you know you you really have to do something else first. You oh, do. It's, by the way, a very beautifully put. It's a very complex, I just want to say, uh, it's very hard to talk about. This, yes. Yeah. But you just spoke about it very beautifully. And, and you, you captured my sense, and I, I want to say, I tried to read, the first time I tried to read The Ambassadors, I failed. And I, I had to put it down. I was not, the, I wasn't who I needed to be to read that book yet. Uh, but when I finally read it, and I finally did read it the way that uh, Henry told William, his brother, how he ought to read because William hated that book. <laughs> and he said, it's a terrible book, you're losing all your readers, now you're really not going to make money. And he was right. Uh, but, J but Henry wrote back to his brother and said, no, no, you're reading it all wrong. You need to read two paragraphs a day uh, at that pace. And so I did that, and I absolutely, for me, that book, the entire book shimmered in that way. I, I felt that he held... He held uh, the medium and reality in that book uh, throughout. I mean, it was it, it, anyway. So beautifully put. And can I bring us back down to the ground now a little bit? Uh, I want to read you something Virginia Woolf said about Henry James. To be as subtle as Henry James, one must also be as robust. To enjoy his power of exquisite selection, one must have lived and loved and cursed and floundered and enjoyed and suffered, and with the appetite of a giant have swallowed the whole. Uh, and I guess I wanted to ask you about this, this kind of uh, contrast or dilemma between this kind of messiness of living and life and the subtlety and shape of art. Which I suppose, um, you know, the relationship between James and Virginia Woolf is interesting. For her, it was important, first of all, was that he had known her mother in, in a way that she had not. Her mother died when she was young. And James had admired her mother enormously and, um, and then had known her father. So she knew James when she was a young woman. She thought he was hilarious. He would come around because he was a friend of her father's and he would talk and he would talk. And the full stop would not come. <laughs> and there were many stop clauses. And herself and Vanessa would watch. And one day he fell over. I mean, his chair, he was, he was, he was going to the chair and the chair fell back. But still on the ground, he continued. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sort of held it up. And he um, continued. And then he watched when is it going to come, this sort of fatal bull stop of the sentence. And, uh, and in a way, you know, what, what she herself was doing with, with the idea of consciousness itself as a messy thing, as a thing that was, could be distracted easily. And out of anything, that, uh, allowing in all the random business of thinking, which in that earlier quote you gave, James is suggesting, no, that it's the purpose of the novelist to actually encircle, to cut off at yes. a certain point. Yes. So, so they were, in a way, having an argument with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, but, 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 um, they, uh, so, the funny business of this is that any time you read about James in the practical world, it becomes almost funny. You know, his efforts to do anything. James on a bicycle, for example, trying to lose weight. Or, you, know, you know, the whole, you know, all, all of that. Or, you know, or his car rides with Edith Wharton. Yeah, uh, Edith Wharton sort of taking over his life. But, but and him trying to give directions. Have you read that yeah, passage? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where he, he tried to get directions. He didn't stop talking himself. It's <laughs> ridiculous. From a local in a village. Yes, yes. <laughs> from from the local in the village. Um, the I mean the um, so that 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 way in which he did as an artist, I think, managed to lift things, ordinary things. Or, or leave, leave a lot of things out of his books. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are times when he did try and deal with terrorism in the Princess Cassie Massey, but not very successfully. With ordinary work, say the short story in the cage, which he really, he really failed to imagine what it might be like to work in an office. <laughs> you know, you know the whole world, I mean, it was right for a lot of novels almost, because a lot of, you know, he didn't quite get the business of. You know, what a whole class. I mean, what a whole class of people, the underclass, were actually doing. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why some people really object to him. That he did really write 
about a very small section of society <coughs> who were so vastly privileged mm -hmm. that he missed out on what was going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no doubt about that. Yeah, he was cruel to Dickens, who did deal with the different slices. Yeah, he was cruel to George Eliot in, in her efforts to write about progress in England. Yeah. He thought that was the most boring thing he'd ever heard. I mean, he knew the Prime Minister well, but he had no interest in legislation. You know, he didn't have dinner. <laughs> I think I think for me there's you know it's this question of um, with life versus art is, is a question of the possibility of perfection you know and uh, you know what distinguishes art from, from from life is that while both can be kind of halting in achievement certainly uh, with it, it's really art that tries constantly at least with respect to form to be perfect in allegiance right and that's that kind of puts art on the same level as, as maybe a religious practice where you really do have an allegiance to some kind of form. Whereas your, your, your daily life, like you were describing, where you wake up late and, and everything, you're behind on everything and nothing's going right, is this, is this messy kind of amorphous. <laughs> you see, I think in Ireland it had one more thing, which was that the country became a nation, or saw itself as a nation, a good long time before it became a state. Yeah. And so the imagination, the only way you can really do that is by using your imagination. We, we start imagining ourselves as a people. How that was done was by ballads first, and then by poetry, and then by fiction, mm. and, 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 and in the theatre. So that that world of the word became vitally important in moving Ireland, <clears throat> first of all, into a state of you know, unity as a nation. And um, which was so which was easy to disrupt because it was imaginary, and then becoming the stage. So that those those, those novels, I mean, those poems of Yeats, those plays of Sing, those translations of Lady Gregory, and those ballads took on a sort of sacred force, um, which I think Joyce was acutely conscious of and was attempting to disrupt almost by bringing in a sense of well, this is ordinary city life as opposed to national life. But nonetheless, his books were also part of the argument over what sort of nation and what sort of state. So the books became vital in that in, in that way. Yeah. Uh, just and before I'm gonna, I want to kind of address one more kind of messiness before we begin things today, and that's James's kind of use of other people, other lives. Uh, and I, I guess by way of doing that, I'd like to read you something he wrote about his first cousin, Minnie Temple. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, she liked nothing in the world so much as to see others fairly exhibited, not as they might best please her by being, but as they might most fully reveal themselves, their stuff and their truth. She had beyond any equally young creature I have known a sense for verity of character and play of life in others, for their acting out of their force or their weakness at no matter what cost to herself. And it was this instinct that made her care so for life in general. And, and uh, I'm sorry, just as it was her being thereby so engaged in that tangle that made her, as I have expressed it, ever the heroine of the scene. And I know that you now are quite involved in this art exhibition uh, with, with Frank Dovenek, uh, who, who James kind of used in a lot of work. And I, I guess I wanted to hear your thoughts on the use of others in, in our work, either with respect to James or yourself even, or other, other artists. Um, I've been curating a show for the Morgan Library called Henry James and American Painting. And just, uh, just in going through um, how he connected to the visual art, I, I, I came across the following story. It starts by going in to a building on Bellasguardo, the hill overlooking Florence, into the apartment of a man called Francis Booth and his daughter Lizzie. It's still there. It's exactly as James describes it in Portrait of the Lady. In other words, the apartment of Gilbert Osmond and his daughter Pansy was a real apartment that James visited, lived in by a man and his daughter. James had no hesitation. He needed a man and his daughter for his novel. He, he, found, he found them. They were, they were friends of his, and they remained friends of his afterwards. And into this world comes this painter, Frank Dominic, who arrives first in Munich. He loves beer halls, he's penniless, he's talented, he's rough. 
he isn't out of this, this world of, of Boston inheritance, and he falls in love with the daughter Lizzie um, in real life, in real life. James watches this, fascinated. He gets the Washington Square from, he's writing Washington Square as his friend Lizzie Booth is falling in love with Frank Dovenek, who's penniless, with her father in, in, in trembling rage over this. He gets Washington Square. He then gets Portrait of the Lady, where there are two examples of, 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 a, of, a, of a girl who's being married and the questions of money arise. He's seen these people every day at that time in Florence, where he's writing the book. He's using their apartment. And then later on, he uses them further in the Golden Bowl, when there's again the configuration for the third time he uses a father and a daughter, and the daughter marrying or falling in love with someone who, who is unsuitable or untrustworthy. When all of this came to James, by uh, the painter Frank Dovenek and Lizzie Booth. He watched them, he watched them, and he watched them. Yeah. Now his argument would be that he didn't use them. I mean, I mean it, isn't, it, it isn't Frank Dovenek, the painter. It's the configuration, it's the shape they made. <coughs> it's, it's almost a shadow. He took their shadows and gave their shadows substance. But nonetheless, you, 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 you can trace it right through and again to the idea that it wasn't quite that he used his cousin Minnie Temple, which was he wanted to establish an idea in Portrait of a Lady and in some of the other books of what he called the American girl, that there was some new thing in the world that novels could use brilliantly, that the American girl in the second half of the 19th century ceased to be interested in rank. She didn't just want to marry someone rich, she wanted to marry someone wonderful. She wanted to have a, a life, a something for herself that was spiritual and that was exalted and that was almost transcendent. As opposed to an English girl, you know, Lord Warburton's sister will marry according to rank and in Jane Austen you marry 10,000 a year if he's good looking and, and that's all the better. But he's, the amount of money he has becomes the issue. For the American girl, she would not have wanted Mr. Darcy because it would be something hard and, and about that she just would, would just push out of the way for someone else. And um, <laughs> someone had some sort of spiritual connection to her. And um, so, but, but what he was interested in was bringing this American girl into a social world, find a configuration for her. Almost instead of making a portrait of a lady to make a group portrait, <clears throat> the lady is involved with certain other figures in the, in the portrait. So it's not merely using the character. Now, th now this is very difficult um, if you are finding that you're using your own family in a book, um, for example, um, where you really do have to say a certain time, no, what I'm doing is I need something and I took parts of you. Yes. But that doesn't sound good. <laughs> it really doesn't. Because the problem often is never, it's not what you used, it's what you changed that people mind. That's right. And that, that you didn't stick to the facts of the case, you took some facts, and then you had your own little horrible ones. <laughs> and they're all horrible. And, they're all horrible. <laughs> and no one knows the difference anymore. <laughs> and um, yeah. so it. You know, I mean, I remember someone saying quite early on, you used our lives in that book. And I to say, well, I used your house, certainly. <laughs> you know, because I like using real houses. I certainly used your house. Oh, yes, you're right, I did. Yes, yes, that, well, but, you know, there are small things I needed on the day. And I often, you often work, I don't know if you do this, where you think, I'll put this in now. Maybe I'll take it up later. Yes. I mean, either forget or decide not. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, a novel is a record of those days. And then yeah. It ends up I mean, I, it's one of the first short stories I wrote. I had a woman in Ireland who's very, very untidy and slovenly. And um, she doesn't bother setting the table. She simply gets all the knives and forks and puts them in the middle of the table. And if you want them, you just have to take them. Well, my mother did that. I mean, that was one of her hallmarks, really, I suppose. And when she went to search the Oh, everyone's going to think that all the other things in the story are me too. And if I'd known you were going to use that in the story, I would have set the table every day. <laughs> <laughs> I just needed to detail quickly to establish 
that she was not particularly domestically, you know, in, in, in time. But, you know, we did gaze at one another. It was quite a hard and long one. <laughs> and learned how to use something that was actually private. Yeah. Uh, but that was a small example of something that became, I think, a larger question. Yeah. Well, I, and you're going to need your glasses for this one, I think. But we're, we're going to circle back around to our kind of inspiring statement now by way of a, a remarkable letter that James wrote to a friend of his who was suffering from grief. And in this letter, uh, James essentially uh, reveals his uh, moral vision of life and, and arts, art's place in that vision. Uh, you know, if, if art really helps us to see, then this letter makes clear why art makes life, makes interest, makes importance, and, and why James was able to say that he knew of no substitute whatever for the beauty and power of its process. So um, I'll read just the first little part of the letter, and then Colin will close us out with the latter. James writes to his friend, I don't know why we live. The gift of life comes to us from I don't know what source or for what purpose. But I believe we can go on living for the reason that life is the most valuable thing we know anything about. And it is therefore presumptively a great mistake to surrender it while there is any yet left in the cup. And, and by the way, that ought to tell you the, the state that his friend was in when he wrote it. In other words, he writes, consciousness is an illimitable power. And though at times it may seem to be all consciousness of misery, in the way it propagates itself from wave to wave, so that we never cease to feel, and though at moments we appear to, try to, pray to, there is something that holds one in one's place, makes it a standpoint in the universe which it is probably good not to forsake. Only don't, I beseech you, generalize too much in these sympathies and tendernesses. Remember that every life is a special problem, which is not yours, but another's. And content yourself with a terrible algebra of your own. Don't melt too much into the universe, but be as solid and dense and fixed as you can. We all live together, and those of us who love and know live so most. We help each other, even unconsciously, even in our own effort. We lighten the effort of others. We contribute to the sum of success, make it possible for others to live. Sorrow comes in great waves. It wears us, uses us. We wear it and use it in return. And it is blind, whereas we, after a manner, see. It's <coughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. And I think we're going to transition to a, a Q&A now. Right, Fancy? We are, although it seems almost irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the thing is, the, one reason we ended on that last, on that letter is because of that last line that we see. And I thought that, we yeah. both thought that was appropriate to the theme of art and seeing what art does, does for us. Sorry. So if you um, would like to ask a question, I have a microphone which I will pass to you. We have time for a few because you were so generous. <coughs> Quite honestly, I never wanted it to stop. So um, if you have a question, let me know and I'll come with the microphone. Hello. Uh, you know, as you both were talking, that uh, the quote behind you kept, of course, shaping the ways in which you were talking. And I was thinking about you saying that, you know, it was part of, uh, that you were kind of thinking about James and Hemingway, right? And I guess, I mean, part of what I got from your discussion was the ways in which such a deep dive into one writer can shape your life in a particular kind of way. And I guess that line, it is art that makes life, I'm wondering how, what kind of life did James make of you, right? In this, what, what kind of what? What kind of life did this kind of deep dive into James make of you? In the sense that, do you kind of have you looked at him this much as a way of kind of something that was absent, something that you were trying to kind of regain? I, I think that I mean, part of the the question was, of course, that how different this would have been if you had 
stuck to Hemingway much more than, <laughs> than James, right, in the way of how much of all of these interests would have kind of veered into a different line. And I'll start by saying that, that, that Hemingway, too, uh, caused me to pay a, a very careful attention to the world. Uh, so I don't, nothing against, uh, against Hemingway's work. But I will say that in my, when I really came to James appropriately, <clears throat> which was quite late, certainly in my, uh, as, as a, you know, although I did start writing quite late, actually, I was a fine artist before, <clears throat> so maybe it wasn't that late. But when I came to James in my 30s, he, he changed me. I mean, I, I'm forever changed and altered by my reading of James, uh, particularly from Portrait on, uh, and certainly the last three books, uh, because I, it basically has given me more, uh, he's slowed time down for me, frankly. I, I walk differently in the world. I notice things more. Um, I, I just feel like he's fine-tuned my awareness. He's also given me a language for noticing that I didn't have before. So I'll stop there. Um, I mean, it's important to remember that that he isn't alone. You know, that that. Well, there's an answer to it. And um, he's been really useful for me technically in that whole idea of concentrating in a novel on one character and one character only. What that character sees, notices, perceives, becomes the sort of texture and fabric of the novel. Now, other writers don't do this. I can. That's the only thing I can do. I cannot do a novel in which. Everybody is noticing everything, seeing everything, and it's moving all around. I can't do that. It's always good. I'm trying to picture one particular journey of one particular consciousness, but, but, but a consciousness on a journey over time. And I certainly got that from James, and I saw him refine it and use it. But I'm also fascinated by his relationship to George Eliot. And uh, she was engaged with England in a way that he could never be. Yes. And uh, therefore, in Middlemarch, she's attempting a panorama of a certain moment in England that she, the moment around the first Reform Act of 1832, which, when she really thinks that England is going to change now, and the English she's writing in is going to come into being, and even more with, with the novel Daniel Deronda, in which she's going to even see into the future. But, but also, um, both of them circling each other. And then, of course, for me, the figure of James Joyce emerging out of this. But I, I can't find much in common between um, James Joyce and Henry James, except, of course, in the story of the dead, yes. where, where you feel that sense of male disappointment coming from the intelligence itself, arising from feeling, the, feel, the next feeling being, that feeling will never somehow match its, its own needs. And that, 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 that James did that in the end. And the stairwell. I mean, the, the moment yes. on the stairwell, oh. the visual. Oh, you're absolutely right. right. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. That as he watches her, as she hears the song, he can, that portrait of her as she stands there is a pure Jamesian moment. <laughs> um, but I, I suppose the question you're asking in, in the end is, well, what would have happened if I had lived a life without books, without novels? And, and it would be a very poor thing, I think, just not to have the constant business of being able to reach in to this world that was created by these people over this time and find something that was better than I was. Yes. Um, at a time, maybe, when other things weren't so easy um, spiritually. You know, in other words, I wasn't, I, 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 I wasn't sure I could do that with Catholic doctrine, for example. Uh, but that the novel became for me a space in which I could see things more clearly. And maybe seeing things more clearly is, is, is vital. And then there are times when you don't need it. You know, just, just look, just live, just stop. Mm -hmm. Look up, look out, you know, be. But it's hard. <laughs> Reading is much easier. <laughs> And so true. And I, I just want to add that I love that evocation that you just made of, of kind of being in conversation with the dead, with, with these, these writers that we never knew personally, but who left behind this fabulous conversation that we get to enter into. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, 
about our Greek life. One of the wonderful things that happens when you read a great novel or listen to a beautiful piece of music or great a uh, piece of art is that you go out into the world afterwards and that that shimmer you talked about, that stopping of time, which is really being aware of, of consciousness. You go out and everything has a, um, a, a glow, almost as if the person, the same, talking about the darkness, the same glow that will happen after a great crisis. And you read a book and you come out and it might have been written 100 years ago, but the world around you is more vibrant that. And I must say I felt that when I read the Mass. Yeah, I, I, you just made me recall of, I, coming out of the, uh, was the Albert Victoria Museum, and, and I, was, I, I was kind of having a constable obsession at the time, and I took a walk through Hyde Park, and I saw the park so differently after spending a couple hours with Constable's paintings. Well, Oh, I'm reminded by this of <clears throat> a man named Nisargadatta who said um, to people who came to ask him how they could make <clears throat> lives better, he would say, um, arbitrarily say I am, and don't ask me why, and don't ask yourself why. Just every once in a while, and as often as you can, say, I am. And something will happen that you don't know about. And he put that into practice. And the strange thing is that it worked. He got more and more <clears throat> somehow free. Because he didn't talk about God. He didn't talk about about what you should do, it only said, I am, and actually, I don't know about anything. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that then it becomes, um, there's a wonderful way of playing with that idea, which is called Samuel Beckett. <laughs> where <laughs> yeah. get, cogito, get cogito ergo sum, like, I think, therefore I am. And you take out the ergo, therefore part, you think, I think, well, that's an awful business. It just goes on and on. Some sort of algebra. Like you can't, can't stop thinking. I'm obsessed with funny little things. I'm always adding things up and multiplying and dividing and remembering. It's awful. It just cannot cease. And the other business is I am. Well, I am. How do I know I am? I've got a pain in my leg or something more. I need some food or I've got some dread, dreadful physical need. Ridiculous. And, and then you can really have immense fun. Once you once you once you start you know, working with so I suppose the comic possibilities of that. James, I think, was 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 interested in the idea that that am that being thing is infinite yes. and it's sensuous. And in a way, he was having a permanent argument with both his father and his brother over in their writings, in their in their efforts to I suppose consolidate ideas. Yes. Um, in sentences, and um, his brother more successful than his father, but that what he wanted to do was not consolidate them, yes. actually make them more fluid, um, and, and, uh, give them more nuance, give them more mystery, render them stranger, notice more. Yes. And so that that argument that James was having was effectively an argument with philosophers um, over how much we can consolidate and how little we should. Yeah, he was arguing with the pragmatists yeah. and, and empiricism and logic. Yeah. And he was much more interested in the wash of thoughts and and the and the fluidity and, and the sensuousness, as you say. Yeah. Um, the other thing I just want to say in response to the, you made me think of I mean it's kind of like a mantra that you're talking about. And I and I, I do I too was uh, subjected to a, a, a kind of strict religious uh, upbringing, and and. So I, I read books a lot, almost as if they are my mantras in a way. And they did save me in that sense. They showed me an alternate way. So, yeah. Well, I want to once again thank 
both of you, thank all of you for being here. I think you've done the most remarkable thing, which is, as you first started, you actually made us stop thinking about time. Um, we could go on forever, but um, we'll just content ourselves with being. And, um, and, thank you. and um, please join me in doing what we can to thank, which is to put our hands together. Um, books, and I hope it's not all of you because then there'll be a stampede, <laughs> but um, our speakers have very graciously said they would sign copies, although we do not have a book signing per se. So this is a, a book signing that is not a book signing. <laughs> Thank you.